Hello visual learners, welcome back to the channel. Today we're in the cardiology section of Memory Farm's Top 200 Drugs Made Easy Coloring Book going over the class of calcium channel blockers. So if you're ready, let's color and learn. <laughs> Before we dive into the key points of calcium channel blockers, let's first talk about calcium's role in the body. Most people think calcium only plays a role in bone and teeth health thanks to all the dairy marketing campaigns. Well, calcium is a mineral that also helps with blood clotting, muscle contractions, and regulating normal heart rhythms. By manipulating calcium channels, calcium channel blockers help to treat certain heart diseases. But first, there are two types of calcium channel blockers, dihydropyridine and non-dihydropyridine. It's important that you understand which drugs belong to which type, and I'm about to tell you how to keep it straight with these memory tips. Dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers tend to end in the suffix "-ine", -ne", such as amlodipine, felodipine, and nifedipine. In contrast, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers do not end in "-ine", as hinted by its name, non-enes, or non-dihydropyridines, which include diltiazem and verapamil. But why do we have the two types of calcium channel blockers? Well, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers have great selectivity for vascular smooth muscles such as your blood vessels, so they are great for use in the treatment of hypertension. While non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers have less effects on the vasculature and greater activity on heart muscles and can decrease heart rate, making them a great option for rate control in atrial fibrillation. However, since non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers have a negative ionotropic effect, meaning they weaken the heart's contractions and slow the heart rate. These medications should be avoided in patients with acute decompensated heart failure as they can worsen the condition. As I stated before, calcium channel blockers are indicated in the treatment of hypertension, angina or chest pain, and atrial fibrillation, especially the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. When you think of calcium channel blockers, I want you to use the visual anchor of a cow since cows produce milk, which is a great source of calcium. Some contraindications and precautions you want to keep in mind when using these medications. You want to be cautious in patients with aortic stenosis or narrowing of the aortic valve, as calcium channel blockers can worsen this condition, leading to reduced coronary perfusion and resulting in ischemia. Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers should not be used in patients with hypotension, decompensated heart failure, cardiogenic shock, pulmonary congestion, acute myocardial infarction, second or third degree AV block, and sick sinus rhythm. Basically, any condition where the heart is already having trouble perfusing or pumping. As the name implies, this class of drugs work by blocking calcium channels. Normally, calcium influx is an essential factor for contraction of heart and vascular smooth muscles. Memory tip, when you think of more C for calcium, think more C for contraction and constriction, reminding you that calcium helps with contraction and constriction. Calcium channel blockers inhibit L-type calcium channels, causing a decrease in calcium entry, as you can see here with the visual of the cow blocking the calcium channel. A decrease in calcium entry into cells leads to increased vasodilation, decreased contractility, and reduced heart rate. All right, moving on to side effects. Use the mnemonic, calcium channel blockers like to shred grass because who doesn't prefer grass-fed beef?
All right, S is for slower heart rate as calcium channel blockers can reduce heart contractility and slow the heart rate. H is for hypotension and or headaches. R is for reflex tachycardia that can occur with the initial vasodilatory effects of calcium channel blockers. E is for edema, especially peripheral edema, that may occur within two to three weeks of initiating calcium channel blocker therapy. And D is for dizziness. Of note, constipation can occur and most commonly is associated with verapamil. Finally, some clinical pros and counseling points to keep in mind. You want to monitor your patients for hypotension, peripheral edema, fatigue, dizziness, and bradycardia. Diltiazem and verapamil are CYP3A4 inhibitors, which means they can cause significant drug interactions and should be avoided when consuming grapefruit juice. Counsel your patients to report signs and symptoms of new or worsening chest pain with initial dosing and dose changes. Advise patients to not abruptly stop taking these medications as reflex tachycardia or angina can occur. All right, guys, that's it for today. If you found this helpful, click that subscribe button for more. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments. I will be happy to answer them. If you're interested in getting more information from our Top 200 Drugs Made Easy coloring book, I will leave a link to the product below in the description, and I'll see you in the next video.